What started off as a beautiful day to spend playing video games quickly transformed into the stuff of nightmares. Mysterious and sudden deployments on a need-to-know basis did not inspire much confidence in having a good day, reckoned Patrick. Thankfully, he managed to grab a little bit of information out of the pilots before they left. A well-placed cigarette here, and they certainly helped, and he at least knew they were going to the Northwest Territories. In contrast, Alberta was looking mighty fine compared to some hole in the frozen ground 2,000 kilometers up north. He still remembered mere hours ago when the first sergeant came to him as he was about to go on leave. The timing of it was impeccable, and when he mentioned deployment, there was nothing more he could do. He hated having to break bad news to his squad members, but it had to be done, and he had gone to give it to them straight. Minutes later, they were on board a plane and headed out. They all sat in the back of the plane, a C-17 Boeing Globemaster, talking about the deployment while two other platoons chatted among themselves. Patrick looked over his squad. Seated next to him was Tanner. A good guy, hard worker, but a former pothead from Toronto. David, in front of him, was from Alberta, and a good old redneck. A great hunter, too. He was the best shot in the squad. On the opposite side, Martin, from Montreal. A quiet and usually calm person. Most didn't want to tangle with the big black guy, but he was really nice. Man, the Northwest Territories, really? What are we even going to do there? There's nothing. From Tanner's tone of voice, it was clear he was disappointed with their deployment location. Could be a joint operation with the Americans, so Alaska has a few bases as well. Martin chimed in. With this many people? I doubt it. Fuck, with everything that's been happening this year, it has to be aliens. David replied, with a hint of sarcasm in his voice. We're not even there yet, and I already miss Alberta. Things I never thought I'd save for $400, Alex. Tanner was now looking down at the floor, feeling dejected. Well, whatever it is, it's important. Patrick stepped in, trying to keep morale up. They were sending everybody up. This is the third plane. The flight lasted a few more hours, and they chatted a bit more about irrelevant topics before deciding to try and get some rest since they weren't sure what awaited them there. One of the first things they were taught was the ability to sleep anywhere, which certainly helps when you're in the armed forces. The plane's powerful engine's roar was hard to ignore, but with enough training, anything was possible. Patrick awoke from a jolt of the plane, the landing wheels hitting the ground and giving it a small bump. They all exited in an orderly fashion, finding themselves in a small airfield in the middle of nowhere. After everyone disembarked, the Boeing took off, leaving the company of soldiers alone on the ground. Transport ETA is 25 minutes, yelled the Master Sergeant. Fuck, we gotta wait out here in this cold? Complained Tanner. Just keep moving, you'll be good, replied Patrick, running in place himself. Ugh, this is barely chilly. David lit up a cigarette, looking around at the other squads. The 25 minutes flew by and turned into 35 minutes until they saw another Globemaster in the sky. They stood to the side of the runway, if it even deserved to be called that and watched as five Namastars were unloaded. They boarded up, twenty in each vehicle, along with some equipment, and headed out on the road. A two-hour ride later, after leaving the small town their airport was based in, the Navistars stopped, letting the soldiers off before going to unload their additional cargo at the nearest provision stockpile. A small temporary base was already set up, uniformed American Marines going about their work. Oh man, I told you we'd be working with the Americans. Martin said proudly. Whatever free time they thought they had was cut short as the Master Sergeant began yelling, All right, into the main command tent, let's go. They began following the other soldiers, all lining up to enter the double flaps of the main tent, an apparent very temporary construction for a location like this. Standing up in a wooden crate, an obvious officer looked at the crowd of soldiers pouring in and waited until all were inside before he began talking. At ease, soldiers. I'm your battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Hessner. For the sake of brevity, you all now possess level 3 top secret clearance. If word of what you hear today ever gets out of this goddamn base, a court martial will be the least of your worries. Now this is the third time I have made this briefing today, and I'll still have to do it a few more times, so keep your mouth shut and your eyes up front. You could have dropped a dime on the floor and heard. It was so quiet in the room. Everyone was granted top secret clearance? What kind of madness was this? It meant that whatever was going to come out of the Lieutenant Colonel's mouth was so secret in nature 
that only a handful of people were allowed to know, but somehow, now they needed a whole regiment to know? Nothing good could come of this. The battalion commander began his speech. 53 hours ago, American civilians brought this image to a news network. The lieutenant colonel shows the image of a Dakar on a projector. No, this is not fake, we checked. Thankfully, we were able to avoid a spill to the media, as the CEO of said media company decided to contact us first. 29 hours ago, these aerial pictures were taken. Pictures show strange buildings in a tundra environment. That settlement is of an unknown origin and located in the Northwest Territories, near the Alaskan border. The Canadian and American governments have decided to cooperate on this. This base will be jointly shared with our American counterparts. There was a brief pause as he drank water. I'm sure many of you are wondering why we need hundreds of boots up here. Well, we're going to establish a perimeter. Whatever these things are, we cannot permit them to simply spread out. No, we don't know where they came from or how they got there. This has still been investigated. Now I'll let your commanding officers give you your specific orders. You're dismissed. Not even after getting 20 feet outside of the command tent, a lieutenant intercepted Patrick's squad. Hey, got your orders here. We're establishing a perimeter and we need boost to patrol this perimeter. You guys are lucky enough to be on first patrol. He handed them a map of the local area, their path marked by a red pen. Patrick saluted after receiving the orders, and waited for him to walk away before he turned to his squad. Even after all the stuff we just learned, I suppose it's comforting to know that lieutenants are still assholes. Tanner walked up to Patrick and looked at the map the lieutenant gave him. Are we getting close enough to see them? No, it doesn't look like it. Tanner's excitement dinned a little, and he gave out a disappointed sigh. Perk up. From the looks of it, we'll be able to see the compound in the distance for most of the route. Patrick flipped through the pages for a few moments before folding them up and stuffing them into a pocket on his vest. We should get a move on. We can figure out our barracks arrangements when we get back. After grabbing their equipment from their bags, they placed them on the side of one of the large tents and started to check their gear. Helmet, gun, vest, gloves, backpack, map... I'm all good. How about the rest of you? Patrick looked over to his squadmates, each of them giving a thumbs up, verifying that everything was in order. Good. Let's move out. David, take point. Cold, wet and windy. A shitty day turned worse with a surprise deployment in the middle of nowhere. Campos thought that once they got here, a base would already be set up, but he was pleasantly surprised to see that, in fact, they had to set it up. Nothing better than backbreaking work after deploying without warning to an undisclosed location. It was only after all the grueling work that they were actually briefed as to what they were doing here. Tear fell back into his rack, his hands covering his face. Aliens. Of course it's fucking aliens. Why would it be anything else? Burdine sat in the rack next to him while snacking on a protein bar. I thought they looked pretty cool from the pictures. As annoying as they were at times, they were some of the best marines Campos knew. That's not to say that he didn't enjoy breaking the news to them that they would be on patrol early tomorrow morning, but for now they had the rest of the day to themselves as a reward for helping set up. Fifty dollars says Burdine is going to get more while trying to fuck one of them. Tear gave a chuckle. Come on, no one will take that bet. It's a matter of when, not if. Their conversation was interrupted by the tent being opened, and a voice asking, Is this Barracks Tent B? Campos turned to see four Canadian soldiers standing at the door looking particularly lost. They were in fact in Barracks 10B, but it was obvious that they were looking for the Canadian one. Wrong 10B, the Canadian one is just behind this one, a road down. The one in front gave a smile. Thanks. The four of them turned around, but before leaving, one of them turned around. Nice meeting you, uh... Campos, Sergeant Campos. Ah, Sergeant Campos, I'm Sergeant Patrick. Oh, sorry about bothering you. Nice meeting you too, Patrick, and don't worry about it. See you around. Campos sat on his rack before lying down in an effort to get some sleep when the tent opened again. He sighed as he looked over to see Harrison walking in and holding a radio and wearing a massive smile. Guess what I bought off one of the officers? Keep the volume down, I want to get some sleep and the other squad will be back at any minute. Campos rolled over and slowly drifted off to the sound of the radio. Morning came quickly. Perhaps quicker than Campos would have liked, but he had a job to do. Burdeen, however, didn't see it that way and needed a little extra motivation. Thankfully, an inverted rack was enough to get him up. The morning sun hung just above the horizon, painting the landscape and sky with an orange hue. 
the frosty tundra squished under their feet as they walked along their route. It wasn't ten minutes into their patrol when Canvas felt something cold hit his nose. He looked up but didn't see anything. Holding out his hand, a snowflake landed on it before quickly melting into nothingness. The snow steadily picked up as they went, quickly covering the ground in a thin layer of white. It wouldn't stay though. The snow would eventually disappear as the sun rises. Campos closed his eyes for a moment, taking a deep breath and listening to the soft howl of the wind. The air was harsh and cold, chilling him to the core. Man, why can't we just bomb the hell out of them instead of patrolling around all day? It would be way cheaper and easier. Because, Harrison, bombing everything out of existence isn't always the solution, and the higher-ups really enjoy watching enlisted walk all day. I should have gone to college, but no. No, I'm in the middle of nowhere freezing my ass off. After their rambling subsided, the squad stood atop a hill, staring at the alien compound in the distance. It seemed strangely surreal to see it in person. Actual buildings constructed by intelligent beings other than humans. Where had they come from? Why of all places did they decide to set up here? With a count of 24 permanent buildings, they must have had something planned. The squad leader took out his binoculars and peered into them to get a better look of the alien compound. He could just make out figures digging a redoubt around the compound, and others were setting up what appeared to be some kind of static defences. Their fortifications were lacklustre at best, but if they were fortifying, that means they at least knew something was up. Alright, that's enough standing around, let's get going. The snowfall only worsened as time went on, obscuring their vision to the point they had trouble seeing a few hundred yards in front of them. It wasn't long until they began to crest another hill, only a few more before they could head back and rest. Their patrol would be monotone if it weren't for the fact that there's a very real chance that they could get into a firefight with aliens. It was tiring though. Their feet sunk into the tundra with each step, making it a chore to even walk. When they neared the top, the everlasting sound of the wind was undermined by tears shouting, Shit! Contact's on our right, 50 yards! Instinctively, Campos dropped to a prone position and readied his gun along with the rest of his squad. He turned to meet the threat, four figures approaching them at a slow walk. Peering into his sights, he aimed at the figures immediately recognising their camouflage uniforms. With a sigh, he slowly rose to his feet. Stand down, it's the fucking CA. The fuck are they doing sneaking up on us like that? We should smoke them. Don't waste your ammo. Campus brushed snow from the front of his uniform before waving over the Canadians. One of them returned a similar gesture as they continued forward. When they got closer, something about them seemed oddly familiar, but he just couldn't put his finger on it. It took a few more moments for him to realise that it was coincidentally the squad that had accidentally walked into their tent the night before. The Canadians didn't seem to recognise them at first either. That was until they were just a few feet away. Campus, was it? Funny running into you. That was quite a spook you gave us. Not that it needs to be said, but that could have gone way worse than it did. Well, I'm glad it didn't. I would have hated to report back that me and my squad had killed a bunch of marines. <laughs> Not in your wildest dreams. On a more serious note, it would have been nice to at least know that we would be crossing past with other squads, unless someone fucked up and we weren't supposed to cross in the first place. Campos thought for a moment before reaching into his pocket and pulling out a map and opening it. I'm curious about something. Could I see your map with your patrol route on it? Uh, sure. The Canadian squad leader slipped his map out of his vest pocket and unfolded it. Campos moved to Patrick's side to compare their maps. What he saw, he almost couldn't believe. The matter of completely different areas. The pure incompetence and stupidity required to lead to something like this was infuriating to him. Campos closed his map and put it in his pocket. Someone was going to hear about this. Just as he was about to turn to his squad, something caught the corner of his eye. A tall figure wearing a grey uniform not unsimilar to something from World War I, cautiously approaching them. When it saw Campos looking, it stopped and stared back at him with its reptile-like eyes. The alien's clawed hands were wrapped around a brass gun of some sort that connected to something on his back via hoses. It took a moment before his senses snapped back to him, and he raised his gun. Are you guys not paying attention? There's a fucking contact sneaking up on us. Shuffling and a series of curses could be heard, as both squads fumbled to point their weapons at the intruder. The gesture of hostility caused the alien to become obviously uneasy as it took a step back. Before it could retreat any further, a hand forcibly pushed down Campus's barrel. He looked over to see that it was the Canadian squad leader's hand that shoved his gun off target. Hold on, I have an idea. We aren't supposed to have any ideas. Just trust me on this. Patrick shuffled through his pockets, leaving Campos quite perplexed. 
His plan was soon unveiled when he pulled out a bag of beef jerky. You have got to be kidding me.